thank you all so much for joining uh, us today. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today for Sips and Science. When we were talking about giving a presentation, I thought, oh, wildfire history of the Lukiamut, but I think that there's a lot more to talk about. I'd like to hear from you all uh, what experiences you may have had with fire, be it wildfire or prescribed fire. Uh, does anybody have any experiences that they would care to share? As I expected, um, with this audience, we have people who have had experience with wildfire before, be that prescribed fire or probably as well uh, smoke uh, incidents from perhaps 2020. My interest in fire has existed for pretty much my whole life. I attended a number of uh, burnings of Oak Prairie and, uh, of sorry, of Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savanna in my home state of Wisconsin. And then when I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Peru, I actually received my firefighter type two training from Machu Picchu's Historical Sanctuary Park Guards. Um, so there I am with a sheepskin fighting wildfires at about 14,000 feet. Okay, so the OSU Extension Fire Program, we use education, outreach, and boundary-spanning partnerships to foster the resiliency of communities and landscapes to wildfire at, at scale. My work consists of a lot of education and outreach and also partnership building. I do have a component of my job that is scholarship and research. And so I'll share a little bit of the research that I've conducted up till this point. Uh, this is a work in progress. Some of the methods that I use would include geographic information systems. Um, so there is data from Oregon Department of Forestry on geo-reference locations of fires since about 1960. There is monitoring trends in burn severity which indicates uh, since 1984, fires in the American West greater than 1,000 acres, uh, and then also the Oregon Wildfire Risk Explorer. Uh, and then in terms of archival research, there's historic Oregon newspapers through University of Oregon libraries. I visited the Polk County Museum today. There's also the um, State of Oregon Library in Salem and the special collections of the libraries of OSU and the University of Oregon. I spent a day driving around the watershed and just took really beautiful pictures. The agricultural landscape going to the crest of the coast range. There was a land acknowledgement given, but I wanted to call attention to the different bands of Kalapuya that are found in the Willamette Valley, and then also the process of settler colonialism that impacted this landscape and impacted not only the people, but also the ecosystems that are found within the Willamette Valley and Coast Range. In this case, you can see in 1841, you have coast tribes along the coast in 1864, you have Grand Ronde established, as well as tribes along the coast. But by 1880, um, the Siletz tribe has been drastically reduced in size. Uh, and then today, Confederated tribes of Grand Ronde and also Confederated tribes of Siletz Indians. I think it's important to keep in mind that they have their lands um, as reservation land, but they also do a lot of work off reservation lands, particularly working with the watershed councils. Uh, we could also see the situation of the Burns Paiute tribe in terms of 1880, the large Malheur Indian reservation, you know, reduced to less than a thousand acres today. Okay, here's Fort Hoskins, uh, part of Benton County's. Uh, park system. This fort was established by the United States military to monitor the tribes that were located at Siletz and Grand Ron. And then I'm with Oregon, I mean, my name is Aaron Groth and I'm with Oregon State University Extension, OSU, one of the land grant universities of this country. But I think it's important to keep in mind all extension programming takes place on indigenous lands. And so here 
we have not only indicated what the county offices are for extension, but also uh, research centers as well as research forests and experimental agricultural sites as well. So yeah, research and education programming takes place on indigenous lands. By training, I'm a little bit of an odd duck within forestry and natural resources. I'm a geographer by training, so I'm, I'm not a forester. So I would say that I'm an environmental geographer, but I'm an aspiring pyrogeographer. So what is pyrogeography? It's the study of past, present, and projected distribution of wildfire. And also py pyrogeography really sits within the middle of this geophysical environment and fire, biology and fire, as well as society and culture and fire. And then also as a geographer, I have a landscape perspective. Multiple factors influence and interact with and are impacted by vegetation fire. And fires have numerous direct and indirect effects that impact the biosphere, the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, uh, and the atmosphere. And there's relationships and feedbacks between climate, fire, and vegetation. This graph is a puristic graph, just kind of showing here in terms of global fire, we have vegetation burning beginning about 500 million years ago. And then, very importantly, within the past couple hundred years, we've had industrial combustion. Uh, and then in terms of kind of the development of mankind with fire, there's bipedalism, domestic fire, foraging fire, agricultural fire, industrial fire, and then also satellite monitoring um, of fire. I want you all to consider not only the ecological effects of fire and the importance of fire uh, for ecosystems, but also think about community vulnerability and think about what are the combination of the exposure of the social ecological system to a hazard such as wildfire and what the adaptive capacity of the people and the places to absorb and recover from that. So for community vulnerability, that could include below poverty level, unemployment, low income, no high school diploma, speaks English less than well, no vehicle, mobile home, multi-unit housing, crowding, group quarters, disabled, single parent household, aged over 65, aged under 17. And then in terms of trends for the Western United States, the Western United States has definitely seen an increase in the number and as well as extent of wildfires. But I did want to call attention to marine West Coast climate here. So Western Oregon and Western Washington, when the American Geophysical Union printed this publication, um, there is no trend line specifically for the marine west coast climate. But the other eco-regions of the western United States have a pretty definitive um, increase in terms of extent and number of wildfires. So where do wildfires hit? There's an increasing number of uh, homes that are in the wildland urban interface a 41% growth between 1990 and 2010. And where the, there's growth in the wildland urban interface, that results in more ignitions, and that put, puts more lives and more structures at risk. Sorry, this graph's a little bit hard to see, but here we have burned area increasing. Here we have areas that are hectares of prescribed burn. And so there is a general trajectory of an increase in prescribed fire. Unfortunately, almost all of that increase in prescribed fire has occurred in the U.S. South. The Southeast, each state, they burn about 40,000 acres a year. It's well over 200,000 acres a year that the U.S. Southeast is burning. And the West is pretty stagnant. Fuel aridity is increasing. The number of smoke days per year are increasing. The number of houses in the wildland urban interface has dramatically increased. Um, because of the Clean Air Act and because of local regulations, there has been a decrease in particulate matter 2.5, but the predicted 
uh, particulate matter 2.5 is projected to go up due to number of wildfires. Okay, now we'll get to the area of interest for everybody who's in here. Here's a reference map for the Lukianwit water watershed. I wanted to call attention to the precipitation gradient. So here you have Fano Peak with precipitation over 3,500. You have Green Mountain, an elevation of 741 with precipitation greater than 2,600 millimeters. Vineyard Mountain, elevation 441 feet, precipitation uh, 1,372. Lucky Amut Landing, elevation 46 and precipitation 1,143. So keep in mind that precipitation gradient from the coast range down to the Willamette Valley bottom. Then also here's a generalized map of surficial geology. So you have the valley, valley floor, and then you have hill slope and colluvial. Basically, I just wanted to highlight the impact of the Missoula floods on the Willamette Valley. Uh, vegetation types within this watershed. It's about a quarter agricultural land, um, and it's about 62% conifer. Um, about 5% hardwood, 2% um, grassland. And then in terms of land ownership, the vast majority, it's about 88% private land. Um, and then local, local is about 1%, state is about 7%, and Bureau of Land Management is about 4%. So here's um, fire history ignitions. This is just for the period of 2007 through 2019. Uh, what I wanted to call attention though was for this period of time, there were 302 acres that burned, and also about 75% of the ignitions were caused by humans. Only about 25% were caused by lightning. Um, depends on where you are within the coast range. In the case of Clatsop County, I'm based in Astoria. Clatsop County is about 95% um, human-caused ignitions. Um, here in the Lukiamut, it's about uh, 25% lightning ignitions. The yellow denotes um, lightning. And then here's uh, fire history. Again, this is only going back um, to, the, to the 1990s with ODF's Wildfire Risk Explorer. And there's the 1500 road fire that occurred in 2007 within the watershed. And then uh, while visiting the Polk County Museum today, I came across this article. A firefighter watching a helicopter make a drop of water. That's near Falls City, the 1500 road fire. Monitoring trends and burn severity. So these are just fires that are over 1,000 acres within the US West. This is the Echo Mountain Fire Complex, about 2,500 acres outside of Otis. And then this is the this is the Shady Lane fire, and this is the Rock House fire. There were two fires in 1987 here in Polk County that were over, uh, was over 5,000 acres in the case of the Rock House fire and almost 2,000 acres in the case of the Shady Lane fire. Those fires from 1987, there was extreme fire weather. There were forests closed and, you know, was covered by the New York Times as well as by the, you know, local newspaper server itemizer of uh, Polk County. Here's a map of ODF fires for Polk County since about 1960. And so by decade, I've broken it up. So you can see the total number of fires based on decade 1960 to 69 through as well to 2010 and 2019. Total number of fires, the number of ODF acres burned. So ODF acres means it's under ODF protection. There are some ho homes and households that would be covered under fire departments, um, but there are areas of forest land and also the Bureau of Land Management. Um, Oregon Department of Forestry is responsible for fire protection on not only state lands, but also the BLM, Oregon and California railroad lands, um, and then also private lands as well. So you see for total acres burned per decade then, 
what really stands out during the 80s, you had over 7,000 acres burned because of those two large fires I mentioned. But in total, you know, since 1960, you have almost 10,000 acres um, have burned within the county. So I think that it's important to keep in mind, yes, there are major wildfires like 2020, and there are, have been major wildfires of greater than 5,000 acres within the county. But yeah, over a 50 year period, over a 50 year period, over 10,000 acres burned. It's a 1986 fire near Buell. But I think that those maps are somewhat deceiving or can make us feel somewhat complacent. Some of the largest fires in the state's history have occurred on the coast. You had the Solette's fire in 1849. Um, you also had the Columbia burn of 1902. Here's the Tillamook burn of 1933. And then these the red here are the 2020 uh, Labor Day fires. So using ODF and Oregon Wildfire Risk Explorer and monitoring trends and burn severity, I'm able to get back to about 1961, but using other archival sources, I'm able to learn about fires that occurred previously to the 1960s, including uh, 1954, 1945, 1917, 1910, as well as 1849. So here's Willamette Valley pre-settlement vegetation, circa 1850. What I want to call attention to here is how much the landscape has changed. Prior to 1850, the Willamette Valley was arguably a anthropogenic fire landscape. And then with the expulsion of the Kalahuyan people and settler colonialism, um, fire was very much uh, impacted within that landscape. Not to say that there is an agricultural burning that occurs, um, but the ecosystems such as prairie and oak savanna that are fire dependent ecosystems um, were dramatically impacted by the forcible removal of the Kalapuya uh, as well as settler colonialism. So you have um, savanna and prairie and only a little bit remains. So in 1913, the Polk County Fire Patrol was inaugurated. Prior to Oregon Department of Forestry taking over protection of forested lands, the Polk County Fire Patrol was organized. The Chief Forester Elliott uh, appointed the first uh, fire warden for the Polk County Patrol Association. Fires discovered by Warden, um, incipient fires in the headwaters of the Big Lukiamut. That's from 1915. And then Rick Reel Creek. I remember I was writing an article um, for Polk County Soil and Water Conservation District for the Cultivating Magazine. And I spoke about, you know, what the impact of wildfire on water could be. You know, what, what are the impacts that might exist for water? And then looking through um, the historic newspapers, I came across these newspapers showing that um, 4,000 acres of timber in Real Creek had burned, and the mayor of Dallas led a fire crew, 52 businessmen into the woods to fight a fire because they were worried about the water supply, the drinking water supply of Dallas being impacted. Let's see. Um, so 1921, this is a kind of report that a number of newspapers did on the different fire patrols, but the Polk County Fire Patrol Association patrolled about 140,000 acres of land in 1921. Here's a 1930s survey of forest resources uh, in Washington and Oregon. Uh, what I wanted to call attention to here is um, these are mature stands of Douglas fir. Um, and the areas that are blue, the areas that were blue were areas that were um, recently burned in the 1930s. And then 1940, um, this is from OSU Agricultural Experiment Station. 
financing fire protection for timber lands under Oregon laws. And you can see um, Polk County Fire Patrol right there. Again, you can see areas that are excluded and covered by fire departments. There's a Dallas unit uh, for ODS Western District. The Western District headquarters is in Philomath, but they have a Dallas unit. OSU actually had an entire series of um, fire weather studies on Bald Mountain. This is from the 1950s. So here's an observer measuring weather at a temporary weather station. There was the Valley and Siletz Railroad. So that connected Independence and Monmouth with Valsets. So here's a photo of that railroad, the Valley and Siletz Railroad following the Lukianu. This is from 1854, a fire outside of all sets. Same fire, different photo. It's from the Sayuslaw um, Photographic Historic Collection. Ball sets had a, they created this rig of ball sets. The lumber, the timber people that lived in ball sets created this um, firefighting apparatus. I think it's pretty ingenious, though. They built that. This is uh, going to supply the Mary's Peak Fire Lookout Zone, but again, another really interesting vehicle. And then actually, uh, according to my sources, the Mary's uh, Fire Tower burned down. I believe this photo is from the late 1940s, but subsequently that tower burned down. Uh, and then also, I, I think it's really important to keep in mind, we talk about forest fires, um, and yes, that's incredibly important, but there is also the potential for fires within agricultural zones, as we can see from this photo in terms of fire destroying over $70,000 worth of crops. So wheat and hay and rye, among other crops, can be quite flammable. This is a OSU research prescribed burn conducted at Basket Slough National Wildlife Refuge. Okay, when you all came in, you got a piece of paper, right? And a pen. I want you to think through, draw out your property and think about what areas might be problem areas in terms of fire, safety. Think about are there, are there trees too close to your home? Um, would a fire or sheriff, would a firefighting uh, truck or a sheriff be able to see your address from the road? Um, I want you to take a few minutes to think about your preparedness for wildfire. I want you to think too, think about your neighbors. Does your property abut industrial timber, like Warehouser or Hampton or Stimson? Does your property abut other farmers or small woodland owners? A gentleman just commented that on his farm there were some old growth fir trees that were touching structures, and so the insurance company uh, conducted a drone surveillance of the site and indicated the need to remove those limbs. Um, so keep in mind too with uh, Extension's role as one of education, um, not to say ODF doesn't play, or Office of State Fire Marshal doesn't play a role in education, they do, but we are a non-regulatory, non-administrative entity. Our job is one of education and outreach and applied research. Speaking of which, we have these prescribed fire basics it's a series right now. We have six that are published and six are in the pipeline right now. Why we burn, ecological effects of burning, uh, writing a burn plan. Um, and then in my case, I was just the lead on um, the fire weather module. I showed you all some, some images of old newspapers and talking about ecosystems of the past, uh, talking about fires of the past. But I think it's really important to keep in mind the past is the past, and we really don't know that much about what the future holds going forward. And 
This is from uh, University of California Merced's Climate Toolbox. This is a five-year evaporative drought demand index. The reason why I wanted to show this is because, you know, look at since the early 2000s, how many years Polk County has been in droughts. And so what is the impact of these cumulative droughts on ecosystems within the county, be they forested ecosystems or grasslands? Uh, and what are the impacts on crops as well? The evaporative drought demand index you're able to see over a five-year period, but also you can have a two-year period or a one-year period, or you can change those dates to like a, a 60 uh, day period as well. But that evaporative drought demand index is telling you, you know, what the impacts on soil and water are locally. In this case though, because of the evaporative drought demand index, it's, it could be a decline in precipitation, but also not much water being held within the soil over a long period of time as well. This is June through September. The vapor pressure deficit, the vapor pressure deficit is a fire variable and the vapor pressure deficit is a fire variable that tells us, is there increasing risk of extreme wildfire behavior? And in this case, we see that for June through September, during peak fire season, here in Polk County, that vapor pressure deficit has increased substantially from about 0.65 to about 0.9 between 1979 and 2021. And then July, August precipitation, so we refer to this as our summer wetting rain, we had about two inches of summer wetting rain in 1979, and now it is less than 0.5 inches of summer wetting rain during July and August. So this has implications for uh, wildfire. And then also the May through September maximum and minimum temperatures. In the case of minimum temperature, the minimum temperatures increased from about 46 to over 49 degrees. And the May through September maximum temperature has increased from 68 to about 72. So again, this has major implications for ecosystems. So exacerbation of fire risk, invasive species, scotch broom, Himalayan blackberries, gorse, forest health, pests and pathogens, disturbance, gales, high winds resulting in blowdown. And then we had about 230,000 acres of heat scorch from the June 2021 heat dome in Western Oregon and Washington and this could have long-term impacts on tree mortality. Some resources available to all of you as individuals would be ODF, the Western District, there's the Dallas unit. There are stewardship foresters, so if you're a landowner, stewardship foresters are available to, um, to visit your property and to help form a uh, forest management plan. There's Natural Resources Conservation Service of Polk County, there's the Soil and Water Conservation District. There's the County Emergency Manager. And then there's OSU Extension, the Forestry and Natural Resources Agent. And then two regional fire specialists for Polk County, Kayla and myself. So consider signing up for emergency alerts, not only from Polk County, but also emergency alerts uh, from neighboring counties, perhaps Yamhill, uh, Lincoln, or Benton, to enhance your situational awareness. What can you do to protect your home, land, and family? So this is the home ignition zone concept. It was developed by the Forest Service scientist Jack Cohen in the 1990s in terms of having kind of these concentric rings around a home in terms of areas that you need to perform basic maintenance um, and also control vegetation. So in that immediate zone of zero to five feet, clean roofs and gutters, Replace or repair any missing shingles or roof tie, uh, tiles. Use one eighth inch metal mesh screening to prevent embers from passing through vents. Clean debris from exterior attic vents. The question for you, how many of you think 
the flame front of wildfire is what causes most homes to catch on fire. What, it, what is it that catches most homes to catch on fire? Embers. It, it, yeah, it's embers get flo uh, fly and can penetrate homes, but embers are the majority of cause of ignition for wildfire. Th that's true. There can be, an, in certain circumstances, in extreme fire weather, there certainly can be uh, a flame front that sweeps through, but generally the greatest number of homes lost within wildfires are uh, embers being thrown. Again, you're not trying to create a area of zero vegetation around your home, but you want to watch the spacing of vegetation around your home. Ideally, you don't have any trees or vegetation touching your home. And then also the spacing of those trees. What you're basically trying to do by having this spacing in effect is if you have a crown fire heading towards your home, ideally by having that spacing of vegetation, that crown fire could drop from the crown of the trees and become a ground fire, um, which would definitely give firefighters a far better shot of saving the home. Here's a different way of looking at that home protection zone in terms of kind of the dimensions. So the grass is mowed uh, around 30 feet around the, the structure. The wood pile and the fuel tanks or other burn materials are at least 30 feet away. Chimney is cleaned and screened. Ideally, you have 100 feet of garden hose attached to your home. The driveway is accessible and the address is visible. How many, does anybody here, is anybody here familiar with Firewise or does anybody live within a Firewise community? Firewise, okay. So you can form a board or committee of residents along with other wildfire stakeholders, which could be ODF, uh, local fire departments, but your local fire department, state forestry agency, elected officials, emergency manager, and this group collaborates on identifying the site's boundary and size. So minimum is eight individual households and a maximum is 2,500. So multiple Firewise communities can be located within a single large master planned community or homeowner association. Can obtain written wildfire risk assessment from ODF or from the fire department. The assessment should be a community-wide view that identify that identifies areas of successful wildfire risk reduction and areas where improvements could be made. Emphasis should be on the general conditions of home and in relation to the home ignition zone. And the document needs to be updated about every five years. Here you can see firewise sites across the state of Oregon. And then specifically here within Polk County, there is the Salt Creek neighborhood which is, uh, was recognized in 2018. And then in terms of the Polk County Long Range Plan and the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, these plans really stress creating defensible space near home, um, improved access for emergency vehicles, um, documentation of available water resources, uh, as well as the key infrastructure for fire protection, as well as address posting. Some current challenges on forest land identified by the long range plan, fire, insects, uh, laminated root rot, lack of structural diversity, fluctuating markets, and then current funding efforts are addressing stand density to improve forest health, as well as understory development. So some key points, under the right conditions, fire is a risk within Polk County high temperatures, low humidity, dry fuels, and east winds of August and September. More research is needed to elucidate a robust fire history for the coast range. A coast range lightning can cause fire, but it is rare. The vast majority of fires in the region are human caused. The Willamette Valley has fire dependent ecosystems, such as prairie and oak savanna. You can take steps to prepare for wildfire and foster fire resilient landscapes. 
Okay, and here's my contact. In terms of cultural fire, indigenous use of fire, there was a In the Woods podcast done uh, with David Lewis, uh, an instructor at OSU in Anthropology and Ethnic Studies, um, as well as uh, Amanda Rao, who departed our fire team to work with Oregon Department of Forestry. There's a link to uh, that episode. And then also you can learn more about decolonizing a prescribed fire on the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network blog. We have Smoke Ready Oregon, preparing for wildfire smoke, a recorded webinar. Keep your home and property safe from wildfire. Uh, the Home Ignition Zone, protecting your property from wildfire. Fire resistant plants for the home landscape. A land manager's guide for creating fire resistant forests. We have an 11 part fire aware, fire prepared uh, webinar series. We also have the prescribed fire basics modules. Those six uh, will hopefully be coming out in the spring, the six new ones. And so here are some calls to action. And, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. I really appreciate and um, I'm happy to take your questions. I really appreciate you all uh, coming out tonight. Thanks so much for making an awesome Sips and Science. Thank you.